I'm starting the recording now. Um, God, we miss you. We miss you with breaking hearts. We seem to have lost our way and are so lonely away from you. We want to come home to you more than our hearts can bear. Thank you for our complete defeat. Thank you for the pain of the downward journey. Thank you for leading us to each other and to the path of seeking you. Please allow each of us this weekend to experience your presence at a new level. And from that to show others how to better know you. May we always be in the present moment with you. And I like that prayer very much. It's, it's Sandy Beach was doing a spirituality weekend and, uh, and this, we're just going to go over a couple things about the, what we're doing. I don't want to spend too long on this. When restless, irritable, or discontent, kneel and ask God to keep me abstinent. The other concept is that recovery is only good for 24 hours. Pray, go to meetings, tell the truth. And then the book Alcoholics Anonymous was written with the assumption that the steps would be taken in a matter of hours. That's when they wrote it, that's what they came up with. And this is a quote from Bill Wilson. It's a speech he gave in 1951. Don't make a project out of working the steps. Go through your day being the sort of person you would like to be, trying to help someone else making sure you don't hurt anyone. When you get to the end of your day, review the 12 steps and you will find that you have worked them all. And back in the 1940s, newcomers to AA meetings would frequently be sent to a newcomer meeting to work the steps before attending the regular meeting. This is how many groups achieve success rates of 50 to 75%. Beginners meetings were required to be allowed into the regular meetings. And I would just add a footnote to what's written there. I heard Sandy Beach say that this process of going through the steps in just a few hours, if somebody's committed, it really doesn't make a difference whether you take longer or do it like this. But it, I don't think it hurts anything. That's my, my belief. And then this guy, uh, Wally P, that wrote the the book Back to Basics, which is what we're, that's what we're doing, interviewed a hundred people who were sponsored by Dr. Bob. And also the concept that the book Alcoholics Anonymous is too complicated for newcomers. Dr. Bob would actually read the book to them. And then just, I thought this was interesting, in the 1940s, sponsors would call sponsees and sponsors would also go to visit a sponsee wherever they lived. And in the olden days, the sponsor would choose the sponsee. That's different from how we do things now. And then uh, Dr. Bob said that this is a simple program. And then I like the quote from Clarence Snyder. He, he was in the first three editions of the big book that said he was the home brewmeister. This is a simple program. If you think it's complicated, you're not working it the right way. All righty. Uh, right now we're going to have a discussion. And uh, this is how did you find your abstinence or how have you heard of someone else finding abstinence? And I can, I can tell how I found my abstinence. I was in a meeting on uh, April the 7th of 2016, and somebody told me, if you keep having an eating binge with a food, don't eat that food. And for me, the scales fell off my eyes, and I realized that I'm a compulsive overeater. And I now I still do other things, but I have not had an eating binge since that day. And for that, I'm very grateful. Anybody else? I've also heard of people that it was when they prayed, that's when they found their abstinence. 
And then I've also heard stories of where people, their sponsor wanted them to pray on their knees. And they found their abstinence when they prayed on their knees. And there's a guy out in California, his name's Ron. He went to AA meetings to work the steps because he, he, didn't, he didn't do all that well at the OA meetings. And I've heard other people do the same thing. They go to the AA meetings to be able to work the steps. He got an Alcoholics Anonymous person to help him with the steps, even though he didn't have a problem with alcohol. Any, any other way that you've heard of people finding their abstinence? I've also heard of people that it's when they called their sponsor before they had an eating binge. I've heard, I've heard of more than one person that they called their sponsor before they took, took a bite and then they've been abstinent ever since. And it's not the same for everybody. That's, that's an important thing, that not everybody finds their abstinence the same way. Do you want me to share it or something? Yeah, go ahead. If, if play, the ways that you've heard of people finding their abstinence. Uh, I found my abstinence by, I, I figured out which foods really uh, were a problem for me. And then, um, I made a list of them and I was able to quantify that list into pretty much five groups of, of things that were, when I ate them, I couldn't stop eating them. And then I stopped eating those foods. That's how I found my abstinence. But in order to keep it, I really had to give those foods away to another person, to a sponsor. I had to give those foods away to my sponsor and I had to um, when, when, when there, whenever there was something that needed to be, uh, before I, I had an issue or something like that, I had to call my sponsor up or another, another member of, of the fellowship and say, Hey, I'm feeling like eating something or even texting them. I'm feeling like eating, you know, some foods that are not, that are on my abstinence list. And, and just the, the sheer fact of making that call, of making that text to other people, to letting them know how I felt helps me keep my abstinence rather than hiding in the dark and, and then eating the food. I actually had to take action to, uh, to keep the abstinence because it, it's not something that you do once and keep forever. At least that's what I found. Thanks for letting me say that. Thanks. Thanks. We appreciate that. So yours is a combination of first you identified, and then you would be in the group that you call, you've had to call before you eat the foods. It's kind of, I know in AA, a lot of people will say, look, if you're drunk, don't call me. I really can't, you, you call me before you take a drink. In fact, I have, I have one of my coins, all my coins I collect. It says, it says the time to call your sponsors before, not after. And if you can't get your sponsor, you call someone else. Any other ways that you've heard of people finding their abstinence? I like, I like Terry's thing that he, he prayed, God help me to be abstinent. And then his battery, he, he inadvertently left his lights on his car. His battery was dead. He couldn't drive to the store to buy his half gallon of ice cream that night. And he's been abstinent ever since, which in my mind is hilarious. You just, you don't, you don't know how it's going to come. All right, we're going to, we're going to move to a discussion of health problems associated with being overweight, anorexic, bulimic, bulimic, or poor nutrition. And I think it's worth maybe just, we don't want to go too long, but I can name the ones that I always remember increased chance of cancer, heart attack, Alzheimer's, diabetes, having my left foot amputated, going blind, kidney failure, 
having to go on dialysis, pain in my joints, having a knee replaced, hip replaced, or both knees, both hips. Um, the poor nutrition, in my mind, if you're not eating a, a, a well-balanced diet, you're really, really making the program hard because your body is screaming for those nutrients. But, and I remember just the, the little simple thing, uh, oh, an increased chance of cancer. Uh, bad things, bad things. If you're the bulimic, it's bad on your teeth. And it's not, it's not good for you to be throwing up like that. It's just not good. It's bad for your health. I don't, I'm not a doctor. I don't understand. Under, anything else y'all can think of that's a, an effect of being overweight. I'm sure I'm missing something. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, it's not so much a medical problem, Rick, but embarrassment. Oh, big time. Big time. Yeah. And, and that was a factor for me because when I was 100 pounds overweight, I was embarrassed to walk around and be 100 pounds overweight. And I remember, I remember vividly when I was 100 pounds overweight, it was hard to get up off the damn couch. And then in my line of work, I, I have to get in crawl spaces and I have to get in attics. It's harder to move around in a crawl space when you're carrying an extra hundred pounds. It just is. Or in an attic. Anything else? Oh, and my mother. My mother didn't like it when I was overweight. I was glad that I got to be a healthy weight two years before my mom died. So before she died, she got to see me a healthy body weight. And that, that meant a lot to me. You know, the health problems associated with being overweight, <clears throat> pardon me, are, um, it's a long-term uh, effects. So when we start out being overweight, our, our body, when we're younger, maybe our bodies are kind of adapt to it, but slowly over time, the, the shoulder aches, the body aches, the knee aches, you know, where, you know, getting up and down, getting down but can't getting back up you know my knees are shot i hear that all the time um and i feel that all the time you know my knees are shot i can't get up if i get up i have to hold on to something and you know push myself up because i can't i can't get myself back up off the floor uh, that, that's a big one but yeah getting in and out of places getting in and out of closets getting in and out of bathrooms you know having to turn sideways in order to to, uh, you know, to get into smaller door rooms or things like that. Um, that's for sure. And, and you know, the, the looks from other people as you, as you walk by, you know, as, you know, they, they look at you like you're like an alien because you're, you know, you're so big. No thanks. 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 And then the, I, when he was saying that, I was thinking about when you're on an airplane, you have to get a seatbelt extension. Or if you're at the amusement park and you're too big, you can't ride that ride. It doesn't matter you waited in line for an hour to ride it. You're too damn fat to ride the ride. They're not gonna let you. It's not safe. They're not doing anything bad. They're, they're trying to make their ride safe. But there's compelling reasons why we're here. That's, that's the whole point. And then of course, we're at step one. We admitted we were powerless over food that our lives have become unman unmanageable. <clears throat> now I'll start the reading out, and if you all would like to do some of the reading, that would be tremendous. And this is out of the, the big book. We of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. To show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered <clears throat> is the main purpose of this book. For them, we hope these pages will prove so convincing that no further authentication will be necessary. We think this account of our experience will help everyone to better understand the alcoholic. Many do not comprehend that the alcoholic is a very sick person. And besides, we are sure that our way of living has its advantages for all. 
I like that passage. That's tremendous. Any comments on that? Very sick people. Yep. Um, that's what it comes down to. We're sick. We have a disease. We have, uh, we're not bad. We're not bad people. Mm -hmm. We may be bad, but we're not, we're, we're not bad people because we have this disease. We're this, there's something in our minds that makes us think, uh, abnormally than other people. And when it comes to food, when it comes to food, I don't think like people who can have one or two cookies or one or two something else and, and be done with it. You know, as far as I was concerned, you know, a gallon of ice cream was one serving, an entire pizza was one serving, um, an entire bag of cookies is one serving. I never looked at the servings. It was only just as much as I wanted. And that's a sickness. And the way I think about food is I'm a sick person. And be, because of that, uh, I had to remember that there's, that there's something that can help me. And this paragraph says that, that to recover, that, that they have recovered. It's a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body, but they have recovered. So when I, when I read that, I think to myself, wow, there's help for me. There's a way to recover from this disease. That's great. I, I agree with all that. I agree with all that. I have an abnormal physical reaction to certain foods and I have a brain that is so limited and I don't know if I had 5,000, 10,000 eating binges in my life. I don't know the number. No normal person would do that. I have thoughts about food that no normal person has those thoughts. Uh, we are not an organization in the conventional sense of the word. There are no dues, there, there are no fees or dues whatsoever. The only requirement for membership is an honest desire to stop drinking. We are not allied with any particular faith, sect, or denomination, nor do we oppose anyone. We simply wish to be helpful to those who are afflicted. And it gives the references from the big book there. That's in the forward to the first edition. Somebody want to pick up the reading, The Tremendous Fact? Sure, I'll do it. Thanks. The tremendous fact for every one of us is that we have discovered a common solution. We have a way out on which we can absolutely agree and upon which we can join in brotherly and harmonious action. This is the great news that this book carries to those who suffer from alcoholism. And why don't you we, keep going? Yeah, man. We believe and so suggested a few years ago that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy, that the phenomenon of craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. These letter types can never safely use alcohol in any form at all. And once having formed the habit and found they cannot break it, once having lost their self-confidence, their reliance upon things human, their problems pile up on them and become astonishingly difficult to solve. The, the comment I want to make is, I heard a big book study, the line never occurs to the average temperate drinker. That's huge. That's huge. And like I was saying before, the thoughts that I have about food, normal eaters don't have those thoughts. When they're upset, it's not like they fight the urge to eat. It would never occur to them to eat because they're upset. They don't even have those thoughts. Never occurs to the average temperate drinker. Alan, did you want to do some reading? Uh, sure, where are we? Men and women drink essentially. Sure, men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. The sensation is so elusive that while they admit it's injurious, they cannot, after a time, differentiate the true from false. To them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. They are restless, irritable, and discontent unless they can experience again, unless they can again experience. Um, the sense of ease. The sense, the sense of ease and comfort, which comes at once by taking a few drinks which they see others taking with impunity after they have succumbed to the desire again, as so many do, 
and the phenomenon of craving develops. They pass through the well-known stages of a spree, emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again. This is repeated over and over. And unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there is little hope of his recovery. Well, I think that's um, an important line where I want you to read in just a second, but yeah, unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there is very, there is very little hope of his recovery. I think that's important. Go ahead. Keep reading a little, okay. read the next paragraph if you would. On the other hand, and strange as it may seem to those who do not understand, once a psychic change has occurred, this very same person who seemed doomed, who had so many problems, he despaired of ever solving them, suddenly find himself easily able to control his desire for alcohol. The only effort necessary being that required to follow a few simple rules. Any thoughts on that? Um, I have been uh, been abstinent, and uh, if I've been abstinent a hundred times, my disease has told me not to be abstinent a hundred and one times. Um, it's absolutely amazing how when I follow a few simple rules, my my mind comes up with ways to complicate it, and. Um, it becomes so complicated that I finally say the heck with it. Guess what I do? I, I do what we don't want to do. Um, this disease is so pervasive and elusive and, uh, it wants to win as much as possible. Uh, and the only way to beat it is to, uh, utilize the power of your higher power. And I've heard people say that it's not my abstinence, it's God's abstinence. Um, and that's a way to think of it because it, it puts more of an onus on you not to, uh, binge or not to lose your abstinence because it's not your abstinence, it's your father's abstinence. Excellent. Excellent. We, we go on in the doctor's opinion, all these and many others have one symptom in common. They cannot start drinking without developing the phenomenon of craving. This phenomenon, as we have suggested, may be the manifestation of an allergy, which differentiates these people and sets them apart as a distinct entity. It has never been by any treatment with which we are familiar, permanently eradicated. The only relief we have to suggest is entire abstinence. If when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely, or if when drinking, you have little control over the amount you take, you are probably alcoholic. If that be the case, you may be suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. That's huge. That's huge. And then we pick up the reading. I'll read a little more. We have been having trouble with personal relationships. We couldn't control our emotional natures. We were prey to misery and depression. We couldn't make a living. We had a feeling of uselessness. We were full of fear. We were unhappy. We couldn't seem to be of real help to other people. And then we learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. The delusion that we are, are like other people are presently maybe has to be smashed. That's huge. All righty. Any well, comments? Can I just, yeah. can I just intercede with one yes. thing? Um, I, um, well, I know that Francis knows, but Rick doesn't know that I'm in another program for children of alcoholics. And one of the um, hallmarks of that is the fact that we are addicted to excitement, not workable solutions. Um, and that is one of the one of the things that I think of when I, I look at these two, uh, two or three paragraphs that we've just read is, um, rather than having a workable solution, i.e. a meal plan that works, 
Um, we, I, my problem is I constantly go off the rails with my, my meal plan. And I don't know if it's because I want you know, the excitement of the food or, or whatever. It's just, it's just very hard to be, um, to be on the same, the same level playing field all the time. Um, and the, uh, being addicted to excitement means that, uh, or, or I'm trying to understand it, it, that I think one of the things that it means is uh, that if something works, uh, I throw a monkey wrench into it to try to see if I can, can somehow figure out to get back to it rather than just going with it while it's working. I throw a monkey wrench into it and try to see, uh, if I can fix it. Uh, and that's, um, uh, to use uh, an analogy that might be in your uh, your line of work, Rick, I might be throwing duct tape all over something when when you would look at it and say that's not the proper way to fix it. But I you know, I would just rather than, than than getting you to fix it properly, I would just continue to throw duct tape on it to try to think that that I can fix it, and I can't fix it. I have to have my higher power fix it, and there's just there's there's no way I'm going to be able to do it. Uh, because the people that uh, that I know um, and, and people in this meeting that I know have recovered have recovered through their higher power. They just they haven't done it on their own. They've done it with with help of with help of the higher power. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. We appreciate that. Now we're going to go around and everyone will individually do the 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 our our, 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 our affirmation here. I'll start it out. Hi, my name is Rick. I am powerless over my binge foods and my life has become unmanageable. Hey, my name is Francis. I am powerless over my binge foods and my life has become unmanageable. Uh, my name is Alan and I am powerless over my binge foods. Um, and conversely said they can be powerful over me, which I don't like. And my life has become unmanageable. Hi, this is Terry. Can you hear me? Yeah, yep. go ahead. Hi, Terry. Um, well, good morning, guys. Uh, sorry, I was late. I was up till uh, 6 a.m. Work, <laughs> working. But um, uh, my name is Terry, and I am powerless over my binge foods, and my life has become unmanageable. All right, your homework is to find the Friends of Bill W. First Step Prayer. We're going to add that to the script. But let's give ourselves a hand because we've done step one. We're done. We're done. All righty. Two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Lack of power was our dilemma, but we had to find a power by which we could live. It had to be a power greater than ourselves. Obviously, but where and, and how were we to find this power? Well, that's exactly what this book is about. Its main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself, which will solve your problem. This means that we have written a book which we believe to be spiritual as well as moral. It means, of course, that we're going to talk about God. Actually, we were fooling ourselves. <clears throat> For deep down in every man, woman, and child, <coughs> excuse me, is the fundamental idea of God. It may be obscured by calamity or pomp, by worship of other things, but in some form or other, it is there. For faith in a power greater than ourselves and miraculous demonstrations of that power in human lives are, fact as, are facts as old as man himself. We finally saw that faith in some kind of a God was a part of our makeup, just as much as the feeling we have for a friend. Sometimes we had to search fearlessly, but he was there. He was as much a fact as we were. We found the great reality deep down within us. In the last analysis, it is only there that he may be found. It was so with us. We can only clear the ground a bit if our testimony sweeps away prejudice, enables you to think honestly, encourages you to seek diligently within yourself, then, if you wish, you can join us on the broad highway. With this attitude, you cannot fail. 
The consciousness of your belief is sure to come to you. That's from Alcoholics Anonymous, How It Works, page 55. Any comments on that? Uh, I'll, I'll say that uh, I believe that to be true. This is Terry. I'm a compulsive overeater. Hey, Terry. Thank you. Can somebody pick up the reading with, yes, we have agnostic temperament. I, I have to figure out how to make it bigger. Is there a way to make it the text larger, uh, a little bit larger, or? Um, uh, you there we go. Okay. Yeah, I'll read. Is that better? Yeah, thank you. Yes. We of agnostic temperament have had these thoughts and experiences. Let us make haste to reassure you. We found that as soon as we were able to lay aside prejudice and express even a willingness to believe in a power greater than ourselves, we commenced to get results, even though it was possible for any of us to fully design or comprehend that power, which is God. Much to our relief, we discovered we did not need to consider another's conception of God. Our own conception, however inadequate, was sufficient to make the approach and to effect a contact with him. As soon as we admitted the possible existence of a creative intelligence, the spirit of the universe, underlying the totality of things, we began to be possessed of a new sense of power and direction. Provided we took other simple steps, we found that God does not make too hard terms with those who seek him. To us, the realm of the spirit's broad, roomy, includes all inclusive, never exclusive or forbidding to those who earnestly seek. It is open, we believe, to all men. Alcoholics Anonymous, how it works, page 46. Any thoughts on that? Um... Oh, not necessarily. Well, I'll go ahead and just say, uh, uh, you know, I think about that every day. And uh, it's, it's just increasingly something that I experience to be true. Uh, you know, it's, that's, just, that's what I have to say about that. Thank you. Excellent. Anybody else? Yeah, I think that also is a daily occurrence. Because of what I may believe today, I may forget tomorrow or I may not want to do tomorrow. And um, it, it's something that I have to uh, uh, renew every morning, so to speak, and renew in the evening as well, is that uh, I, you know, I'm gonna believe or be willing to believe in, in a power greater than myself that can help me restore me to sanity. And uh, it, it's something that just because you do it once, doesn't mean you're gonna keep it. You have to re-up it. I guess every morning, you know, to in order to in order to keep it, you have to re up it. Not best. Excellent. Anybody else? All righty. I'm. We're gonna. We're to our affirmation for step two, and I'll get it started. My name is Rick. And I believe that a power greater than myself can restore us to sanity. My name is Francis. I believe in a power greater than myself that I can restore me to sanity. Hi, my name is Jerry. I'm a compulsive overeater, and I believe that a power greater than myself can restore us and me to Sandy. Thank you. My name is Alan. I believe that a power greater than myself can restore us to sanity. Let's give ourselves a hand. We've done step two. We're done. We're done with step two. Now, we go on. Made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Does somebody want to pick up the reading for a little bit? The first requirement is that we be convinced that any life run on self-will 
can hardly be a success. On that basis, we are almost always in collision with something or somebody, even though our motives are good. Alcoholics Anonymous, page 60. Selfishness, self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our troubles, driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity, we step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. Sometimes they hurt us, seemingly without provocation, but we invariably find that at some time in the past, we have made decisions based on self, which later placed us in a position to be hurt. So our troubles, we think, are basically of our own making. They arise out of ourselves and the alcoholic, we, and the alcoholic is an extreme example of self-will run riot, though he usually doesn't think so. Above everything, alcoholics must be rid of their selfishness. We must or it kills us. God makes that possible. And there often seems no way of entirely getting rid of self without his aid. Many of us had had moral and philosophical convictions galore, but we could not live up to them even though we would have liked to. Neither could we reduce our self-centeredness much by wishing or trying on our own power. We had to have God's help. This is the how and the why of it. First of all, we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. Next, we decided that hereafter in this drama of life, God was going to be our director. He is the principal, we are his agents. He is the father, we are his children. Most good ideas are simple. And this concept was the keystone of the new and triumphant arch through which we passed to freedom. It's from How It Works, page 62. Thank you, Francis. Any thoughts on that? Whew. Oh yeah, our problems of our own making. I say that all the time. Especially when I'm, especially when I'm realizing all the problems that I have are my own damn fault, you know. And I and I and I almost like said out loud, our problems of our own making. Of course they are. Look, look at the mess I've created here. Um, yeah, I'm self-centered. I'm seeking uh, things for myself, and when things don't go my way, boy, oh boy, do I realize it even more and more and more that. Um, I have to be rid of that, but I have to stop thinking of only myself. I need to start thinking about it from the other side. <clears throat> because of that, when I'm thinking about only myself, I'm stepping on the toes of other people, probably by the way I say something to them, probably by the way I put them down or, or make them feel like, like crap. Um, and in doing so, um, there's more and more ways of my self-centeredness coming out. And that's all, all, again, all my problems and I'm stepping on toes of other people. It's all right there in that book. And, and I, I see myself in, in, in the words. I'll pass that. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Does somebody want to pick up the reading with when we sincerely took? Yeah, I can do that, Rick. Thanks. Uh, when we sincerely took such a position, all sorts of remarkable things followed. We had a new employer, being all powerful. He provided what we needed. If we kept close to him and performed his work well, established on such a footing, we became less and less interested in ourselves, our little plans and designs. We were now at step three. Many of us said to our maker as we understood him, God, I offer myself to thee, to build with me, and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self, that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties, that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of my power, of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. We thought well before taking this step, before making sure we were ready that we could at least abandon ourselves utterly to him. Now we launched upon a course of vigorous action, the first step of which is a course of vigorous house cleaning. Excellent. And that's from Alcoholics Anonymous, How It Works, page 63. Excellent. Thank you. Now, this is advice that I got when I went to the Back to Basics. Pray, attend meetings, tell the truth. Kind of simple. Pray, attend meetings, and tell the truth. 
And, and I would just add a personal footnote. If you think you're going to impress anybody at an Overeaters Anonymous meeting, it's like being at the head of the class in summer school. It's just not that great. Alrighty, in unison, we're going to do the, the third step prayer. Prayer. God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. Give ourselves a hand. We've done step three. We're done. We're done. All righty. Now where are we up to? Anyone can guess? Step four. Made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Though our decision was a vital and crucial step, it could have little permanent effect unless it once followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things in ourselves which had been blocking us. Our liquor was but a symptom. And at the workshop, they suggested that you underline our liquor was but a symptom. Oh, and I, I'm, I'm in the middle of, I want to, if you want to, if you want to get calls or whatever, put your phone number in the chat, put your number in the chat. So we had to get down to causes and conditions. Therefore, we started upon a personal inventory. This was step four. A business which takes no regular inventory usually goes broke. Taking a commercial inventory is a fact-finding and fact-facing process. It is an effort to discover the truth about the stock and trade. One object is to disclose damaged or unsellable goods, to get rid of them promptly and without regret. If the owner of the business is to be successful, he cannot fool himself about values. We did exactly the same thing with our lives. We took stock. First, we search out the flaws in our makeup, which, which caused our failure. Being convinced that self manifested in various ways was what had defeated us. We considered its common manifestations. Resentment is the number one offender. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else. From its stem, all forms of spiritual disease. For we have not, or for we have been not only mentally and physically ill, we have been spiritually sick. When the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. In dealing with our resentments, we set them on paper. We list people, institutions, or principles with whom we were angry. We ask ourselves why we were angry. In most cases, it was found that our self-esteem, our pocketbooks, our ambitions, our personal relationships, something, we're in, and uh, I forget how that goes, but anyway. We reviewed our fears thoroughly. We put them on paper, even though we had no resentments in connection with them. We ask ourselves why we had them. Wasn't it because self-reliance failed us? Self-reliance was good as far as it went, but it didn't go far enough. Some of us once had a great self-confidence, but it didn't fully solve the, the fear problem or any other. When it made us cocky, it was worse. We reviewed our conduct over the past over the years past. Where have we been selfish, dishonest, or inconsiderate? Whom have we hurt? Did we unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? Were we at fault? What should we have done instead? We got this all down on paper and looked at it. Whatever our ideals turned out to be, we must be willing to grow toward it. We must be willing to make amends where we had done harm, provided that we do not bring about still more harm in so doing. That's from How It Works, page 669. Hey, Rick. 
Yes. I have I have the end of that passage, if you want to hear it. Yeah, uh, please, please go, please go. Okay. Uh, so it started out, we asked ourselves why we were angry. In most cases, it was shown that our self-esteem, our pocketbooks, our ambitions, our personal relationships, and that's correct. Must have left that out, including sex. Where her, it was what it goes to, were hurt or threatened. So our personal relationships, relationships, and it says including sex, were hurt or threatened. So we were sore, we were burned up. Is how that paragraph ends. So I'll fix that in the next. Yeah, question. yeah, we're good. We're good, Terry. Yeah. Terry, was that the uh, written version of a Freudian slip? Yeah, <laughs> maybe, maybe so. I have to give a like. I like it. I can... I like it. <laughs> Rick. Did you say we'll be able to download this document afterward? Yeah. Because I find I find the big book to be absolutely engrossing reading. I, the same as I find the Bible to be engrossing reading. I can make it through one, two, or three paragraphs, and then I nod off. But it's yeah. it's very good. This is the, These bullet points are very good, and I'd like to get a copy of these after. Sure, sure. Uh, okay. uh, Ellen, if you... Uh... Well, also, anybody just who wants this document, I can email it to you, or Rick can email it to you if you put your, if you, right, Rick? Yeah, put it, email. put it in the chat. Put it in the chat. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, can somebody pick up the reading with, suppose we fall short of the chosen idea and stumble? <clears throat> I could pick up, this is Cherry. Um, Thanks. Suppose we fall short of the chosen ideal and stumble. Does this mean we are going to get drunk? Some people tell us so, but this is only a half truth. It depends on us and our motives. If we are sorry for what we have done and have the honest desire to let God take us to better things, we believe we will be forgiven and will have learned our lesson. If we are not sorry and our conduct continues to harm others, we are quite sure to drink. We are not theorizing, these are facts out of our experience. To sum up about sex, we earnestly pay, pray for the right ideal, for guidance in each questionable situation, for sanity and for strength to be the right thing. If sex is very troublesome, we throw ourselves the harder into helping others. We think of their needs and work for them. This takes us out of ourselves. It quiets the imperious urge when to yield would mean heartache. If we had been thorough about our personal inventory, we have written down a lot. We have listed and analyzed our resentments. We have begun to comprehend our futility and their fatality. We have commenced to see the terrible destructiveness. We have begun to learn tolerance, patience, and goodwill toward all men, even our enemies. For we look on them as sick people. We have listed the people we have hurt hurt by our contact, and we are willing to straighten out the past if we can. All righty. It's Alcoholics Anonymous, it's how it works, page 70. For us, what we could... Just what pick is, pick up, we hope you are convinced. Oh, uh, we, okay. We hope you are convinced now that God can remove whatever self-will has blocked you from him. And you already made decision and an inventory yeah. right. of your grocery handicaps. You have been a, you have made a good beginning. That being so, you have swallowed and digested some big chunks of truth about yourself. I'll hold so I'm going to start workspace 71. Thanks, Terry. Yeah, Thanks. I'm going to pass. Yeah. Now, we're up to our actual writing exercise. Step four. We're going to, on a blank sheet of paper, we're going to answer four questions about ourselves. And this goes on for 10 minutes. The first question is, who or what am I angry at? The second one is, what am I afraid of? The third one is, the harms in inventory, who have I harmed? And then the fourth, what are good things about myself? We want to do an inventory here. So look, I'm going to get my, my timer going and uh, get my sheet up so I can do my inventory. Any questions on this? You're going to leave that on the, on the screen? Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm not going to take it down. But the thought is that you, 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 you write it on your own sheet, and then you answer right those questions. 
Gotcha. Any other questions? And for those 10 minutes, I'll, I'm going to stop the recording. I don't know of any reason to record 10 minutes of silence.